And in this series, we're talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are beginning on page 91. Uh, the person of Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem as king. Uh, the, the, the triumphant entry of our Lord into Jerusalem at that particular moment preceding his, his crucifixion, it, the triumphant ride was arranged by Christ. He is the one that asked for it. And the enthusiasm promoted by his disciples were one of the very few times of enthusiasm in his ministry. Here we behold and we see a glint of sunshine before the awful storm comes of his crucifixion. The gladness of the scene is an awful contrast with the awful sequel that followed immediately, I mean within hours. Palm Sunday, that is celebrated every year throughout Christendom, uh, ushers in what we call Passion Week. This triumph was only a token of the coming uh, reception when, when Jesus Christ shall be received by the whole universe, heaven and earth, as a King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In our reading regarding the person of Jesus Christ entering Jerusalem as King, Matthew's Gospel chapter 21 has been chosen, and verse 1 we will begin. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a, an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. This is a command of the Lord Jesus. If any man shall say unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken uh, by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold the king, thy king cometh unto her, unto thee, meek, sitting upon an ass, and a coat, the foil of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and brought the ass and the coat, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and and strode them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cries, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Jehovah. Hosanna in the highest. That, that was really a, when you get thousands of people saying the same thing like that, it will shake the heavens, you know. All of Jerusalem rang with it. So when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? That's a question that's been going for 2,000 years now. The multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God, cast all of them out that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were greatly displeased, and said unto him, Hearst thou not what these say? And Jesus said, Yea, have you never read, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them, went out of the city, into Bethany, and there he lodged. This a cardinal event in the life of Jesus, one of the greatest events of his total life. A very celebrated event was also a prophetical event. In your point number one, in Zechariah 9 and 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king cometh unto you. He is just, having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foil of an ass. And so, possibly 500 years before Christ, or 450 years possibly, before Christ came to the planet Earth, it was always already said that he would ride into Jerusalem on this humble animal. Now, you, you, you might think that's a, a 
bad one to ride on, you know, uh, thinking of today. But in those days, princes and kings rode those little animals. That, that, was a, that was an animal that if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find very often the kings and princes were riding this humble little animal. And so uh, this, was, this was done to show his kingship and, and his royalty and that he was a king. Now, this event would proclaim his kingship to the people. And so when he did this and the people screamed out and cried, you know, hail and hosanna and so forth, it, it, they were proclaiming his kingship, uh, which those uh, <clears throat> that hated him and those that uh, didn't want him to even, even live, uh, they would be very upset with him coming into the city like a king, and that, that he was a king when it was already a part of the Roman Empire. From the beginning, Messiah's kingdom would be a spiritual kingdom. And, and so uh, this is a spiritual celebration. It did not mean an insurrection. It, 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 it did not mean that these men carried guns and were ready to fight or, 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 or carried swords and spears. It meant that this Messiah's kingdom was a spiritual kingdom and they were praising him for a spiritual celebration that was only a, a view of what is going to come to pass, soon to come to pass in these last days. Now the significance of this entry of Jesus Christ into, into Jerusalem. The entrance of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem displayed his true kingly spirit. He was not ashamed at all uh, of the way that he came in. He, he looked like a king. <laughs> he, he had the demeanor of a king. And, and so when he came in and they were praising him, he was carrying it on, says, yes, th this is the correct thing to do. Uh, and, and this significance of this under B, Jews are forever without the excuse saying he didn't claim to be our king because he came saying I am the king and, and he accepted the, the praise of all these people and so it cannot be said that the Jews did not know that he was a king. The great procession of coming in and uh, if you've been to Jerusalem you can't help but uh, view the thing. You know you don't just talk about it but you see it uh, the, the gate that he went in through, the eastern gate, is now blocked up with blocks because um, an Arab chieftain uh, had read that when Messiah comes, he's going to come through those gates. And so he thought he could keep him from coming in by putting some blocks in there. In a few hours, you could remove all the blocks, of course. Uh, but it's been blocked up now for a long time, uh, the gate that he came into Jerusalem. But he will go back in that same gate because that gate leads into the temple area and so those blocks will be moved one day and a road will be built there. There are graves in front of it right now. And, and he will ride through those same gates in a glorious way, much more glorious than in that first time. And so they were crying, uh, Hosanna, welcome the king. They were welcoming him to come right on in. The multitudes that went before and followed after crying, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed cometh in the name of, of, of Jehovah. Uh, uh, Hosanna in the highest. And they spread their garments in the way and put branches all around and, 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 and let everybody know that he truly was a king. It's amazing that everything fitted in so beautifully. The, the, it was a very, the, uh, Matthew 28, 1 and verse 8 says, And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and stored them in the way. And, and so the man who had the coat cheerfully gave it. He that had the garment gave it, and who had nothing else to give, gave a branch and, and waved it. And all the city was moved when he came into the city. It was an unusual situation that the Roman guards, Roman soldiers didn't even stop it. What is very remarkable that when he went in, his enemies were silenced. They didn't, they didn't say, oh, stop this, stop this. The, the power of the Lord, I guess, was present. And he rode publicly through the streets where Herod and Pilate had their, held their courts, and no one molested him. Alone, he entered the temple, and with a scourge, he chased out the buyers and, and the sellers, and the Messiah felt deep compassion for those people. In Luke 19, 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, if, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from your eyes. Uh, th th this is a, a, one of the greatest scriptures in the whole Bible. Uh, Held from your eyes. There are millions of Americans the same way today. They just couldn't tell you what all these things mean that are going on in our world that we live in today. It's hell from their eyes. 
But you and I have the feeling that Messiah is soon to come, that the Lord Jesus, the same one that rode in there one day on that humble little animal is going to ride through there on another key and on another day with such glory this world has never seen before. The day shall come that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee. This is what Jesus prophesied about Jerusalem. Uh, to compass thee about and to keep thee in on every side. They shall lay thee even with the ground. Now, it was only, it was only like uh, 40 years after that that this all happened. That, that, uh, it had trouble all during the 40 years, but 40 years later there wasn't a thing left. Wasn't a, wasn't a block on top of each other. The, the temple was gone. The walls were gone. And, and the Romans even, even took the ground and, and plowed it up and planted it to be sure that there couldn't be a city there. And, and uh, if, if God loves a city, you know, you can tear it down, but he'll put it back up. And you can't tear down what God wants to be up. Uh, you can try, but God will put it back up because he's sovereign and he can do it. And it says, it shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not. Now you ought to underline that line, please. Thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And now there are much of the world. There's Russia today that doesn't know its time of visitation. For sure they don't understand the time of their visitation. And, and many, many, many Israelis in Israel right now do not understand that prophetically God brought them back there. They're back there because they had nowhere else to go. You know, that's the reason they think they got there. And that isn't it at all, that God brought them back there for such an hour in, in which we live at today. Christ saw their blindness. The son knew the judgment that was coming upon them. He, he, he realized this. All right, the kingly deeds uh, that, that he did in the city. In Matthew 21, beginning in verse 12, it says, Jesus went into the temple. He cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. It is an amazing thing that nobody stopped him. The temple was full of people. Uh, the, the authorities were on every hand, and nobody laid a hand on him at all. When it comes to the fulfilling of prophecy, there isn't enough strength in this world to stop prophecy from being fulfilled. If God says a thing's going to be, it'll be. It don't matter who don't like it. It doesn't matter who don't care for it. It will be, you see. And, and, uh, and we can rejoice and say, Lord, we know. We know and understand the times in which we live. It will be the same in the coming of the Son of Man as it was when he walked planet Earth. The people will not understand the signs of, of his Messiahship and his coming. But they that study the Word and love the Word and love him, they will understand. If you're glad for it, say amen. All right. And he said to them, my, 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 my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. The blind and the lame. And he healed them there. Nobody stopped him. Nobody stood in his way. And, and, and so we find that the king cleansed the temple. And after cleansing the temple, he healed the sick. We should observe things like that very closely. He didn't heal the sick first. He cleansed the temple first. And if, and if you want something great done for you, if you want beautiful things done for you, then the first thing you have to do is have the temple cleansed, your body, to have your temple cleansed. Then after the temple is cleansed, then he can do miracles for you. Many times we want, we want Jesus to do miracles for us, but we had not cleaned the temple. We haven't cleansed the temple. And, and so what we need to do, all of us, what we need to do is to first cleanse us. If the church were to cleanse itself today, it could see mighty miracles take place on planet earth. I mean mighty miracles. But until it's willing to cleanse itself, it will not see the mighty move of God. And if God has to use a segment of the church, he'll do that and bless that part. And the other part will go its way unblessed. And I want to be with a part that's blessed. Can you say amen? All right. The, the master educated those people. In Luke chapter 19, verse 47, And he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. That means they whispered behind his back and said, how can we get this guy out of here? How, how, can, we, how can we get rid of him? What are we going to do to get rid of him? He's, he is a nuisance to us. He's a problem to us. What are we going to do to get rid of him? And he was teaching in the temple every day. And they couldn't do anything about it. There, there he was. And they whispered, destroy him, but they couldn't do anything. And, and point number seven, you have the king's entry into our personal lives. We cast our garments before him, 
uh, it, is, it is so necessary for us to have a, a deep praise situation inside of us, uh, for, for us to have uh, within us something that magnifies the Lord. We, we see His greatness. We see how marvelous He is. We see how glorious He is in our, in our, in our praises, in our praises. Any, any church that doesn't praise God cannot have the maximum anointing and blessing of the Most High God. It is impossible. And any, any person, any individual that says, well, I just don't like to praise God. Well, that's because you don't love Him. That, that, that's because you're not close enough to Him. If you were truly close to Him, and, and if His anointing was truly upon your life, it would be a joy to praise the Lord. And a person in a, in a melancholy situation, uh, or, or a depressed situation, or a fearful situation, they are not able to adequately praise the Lord. Praise comes from forgiveness, when you know you're forgiven. Praise comes from depressions all gone and the fullness of joy flowing through you like a living river. And praise comes to us when we know that all the things are taken care of. We've done them. And now we can just praise and magnify the name of the Lord. And heaven, heaven rejoices in the praises of the people. And so the king's entry into our lives means that we must cast our garments before him as they did. That's humility. Uh, that's sacrifice. That's giving our all. And then we must cry our hosannas unto him. They belong to him. But we must cry our hosannas unto him and praise him. Now this, this is where we re receive the blessing we want and the power we want and the anointing that we want. But our hosannas belong to the king. Then we must, must cleanse ourselves. In, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. It is very remarkable uh, to me that, that the Bible has taught us that our body, bodies that we walk around in, that our bodies is what God considers His temple. When, when uh, Solomon built that great temple, that was a temple of God. But uh, you and I today are His temple. And we should try to keep our temple as pretty as we possibly can. Not look like a, 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 a strangey dog, you know. Uh, keep our temples. If it's a temple of the Most High God, make it look like a temple. And not like an outhouse, you know. We, 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 are, the, we are the temples of God. And, and, if, and if God has designated us as a temple, we should keep the temple pretty. Are you here? And keep the temple clean and keep it holy and, and give it attention give it attention give it attention um, it's possible that the church has downgraded the body you know that the body don't mean anything the body don't mean anything and and that hurts me very much because it was the body of Jesus that saved you it wasn't his brain that saved you by his stripes you're healed that's on his back the stripes are in his body by his blood you're saved it's in his body, in his veins, you know, the blood was. It was his body that saved you. And we receive our, our blessings from heaven through the body of Jesus. And, and if that be true, and we're the temple of God today, how we should make our bodies look like the temple of God. And, and one way to do that is to keep, keep it happy, keep it smiling. Uh, they say that it takes about 13 muscles to smile and about 22 to frown. So all you lazy folks ought to start smiling. You don't have to work as hard. It, it takes a lot more energy to frown uh, than, than it does to smile. And God wants the temple uh, to be something of joy. You believe that? And that we should say, Lord, yeah, we're going to make the temple a place of joy. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, In what agreement? Uh, hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. Imagine God saying that he would dwell within us. We are his temple. He dwells within us, and that he will walk within us. That when we walk, we walk the walk of God. Ah, but, but if you don't know it, it don't work. Are you here? All the things you're ignorant of don't work in, in your life. A person that's not, that doesn't understand the gifts of the Spirit, they, they cannot get the gifts of the Spirit to function because they won't function in ignorance. And if they function one or twice and you're ignorant, they cease to function. 
Now, I've seen this all over the world, not just one place. And anything you want to know about God, the first thing you do is get enlightened about it. Hey, get to know something about it because it is in, it's in that knowledge that God will permit it to function. And so we must know the truth. And then that truth is what sets us free. And we must understand that we are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. And that God does dwell within us. And God walks within us. And he says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. There was a knowledge there. A knowledge that that's the way it was. Then in point number eight. Uh, there is only one desire. There's only one desire in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is to be made king of all of our lives. He won't accept anything less than that. To be made king in all of our lives. He is not seeking to be made king in a sinful world, full of turmoil, full of, full of violence, full of hurt. He wants to be the king of the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world. And he asked you, and he asked me, help to celebrate the fact of making him to be king. Now, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem uh, brings us uh, to the second uh, a step in this Passion Week. The person, the Lord Jesus Christ, goes to Golgotha. He goes to Golgotha as a priest, uh, as a priest for us. It was at the cross, the place of seeming human defeat, that Jesus won the greatest victory of all times. <laughs> Never has there been any victory so great. In John 19, 17, he bearing his cross went forth into a place called, called uh, place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on, on either side and Jesus in the midst. Uh, Jesus' death on Golgotha, and this is the most amazing thing that I know of personally, it is the most prophetic event in all of history. All right, let's look at some of them. In, in Psalm 41, 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I have trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So he was betrayed by a friend, just as it was said. And then in John 13, 21, it tells you about it. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And in, in, in Zechariah 11 and 12, and, and I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for, for my price 30 pieces of silver. Of silver. There must have been a very strange anointing upon these men. For David, for David ha had to said, my own familiar friend hath lifted his heel against me. Uh, for uh, a man like Zechariah to have said, 30 pieces of silver will be the price. Matthew 26 fulfills that. And then in Zechariah 11 and 13, the blood money purchased a potter's field. And the Lord said to me, cast it to the potter. A good price that I was prized of them, and I took thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord. See, there could be no escaping of understanding it. Matthew twenty-seven seven. And they took counsel, and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. So, just like the prophet had said, the most prophetic, the most prophetic aspect of all history is related to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I guess that had to be. It just had to be, for the simple reason, it is so great, it had to be the greatest prophetic situation. And this would be a sermon for you that are ministers, because you've got the, the prophecy and the fulfillment, and they're all right there together. Uh, Jesus was forsaken by his disciples. In Zechariah 13, 7, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep should be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. He was prophesying about his disciples running away and leaving him. And Matthew 26 and 31, that's exactly what they did. Then, then saith Jesus unto them, All ye should be offended because of me this night. It is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. And so you find there a prophetic thing that was given, like, you know, 400 years before, 450 years before. And it came to pass exactly as it was prophesied. For anyone not to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that would mean he'd have to forsake almost the total Bible, because in the Word of God, it's taught us explicitly uh, in a prophetic vein 
uh, that all the things that happened to him were told before so that when they came to pass, you would know he was the Messiah by all the things that took place in his life and they have never been taken place in any other life except his. Isn't that great? It, it is very exciting.